If this is true, then our country is in a lot of trouble. We would have these trips, these special trips. But he said, my, my daddy takes the bodies to the grocery store and he grinds them up and puts it in the hamburger and nobody ever knows it. How can kids six, eight, ten years old be describing rituals that come from a book like the, like the Book of the Dead? It's hard to get your mind around people being capable of this kind of evil. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Midnight Ride. My name is David Carrico, and I am honored once again and privileged to be able to invite all of you into the Puritan Barn for the Midnight Ride with myself and my co-host, John Pounders. Tonight, the Book of Enoch, Chapter 54, Ancient Monsters in Outer Darkness. Enoch never fails to burst our paradigms and to push the envelope to force us to think outside of the box and to look deeper into those things which we find in the Word of God. Tonight will be no exception. We're going to be learning concepts and paradigms that are going to help us understand the way our world is physically around us and also spiritually. So get ready, the ride starts right now because we are now. Live, 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 what is up? All of you midnight riders out there, I hope you guys are packed down on your saddles really, really good because this is gonna be an awesome one. Uh, this is part of our Book of Enoch video commentary uh, that is exclusively on nystv.org. And uh, we're, we wanted to share this one with you tonight. As David said, the Book of Enoch never um, never fails to just really magnify the, the word in a way that uh, we may not have ever seen it before without looking at the Book of Enoch. It's really, really cool. We're excited to do this. Uh, if you like what you see tonight, go over there and check it out. Subscribe. Use coupon code RIDER, R-I-D-E-R, -E all caps, and you'll get your first month free. And you can check it out and see if you like it. If you don't like it, cancel it. But yeah, I think you guys are going to love it. It's a great way to support the channel, support what we're doing, future documentaries, future shows, etc. So go check it out. Um, we want to thank our sponsors for tonight's show, Joshua Watts Leather Company. Uh, the best custom leather pieces that you can come up with. You go check it out. Check it out. The link in the description, CascadiaCutlery.com, uh, who custom knives, uh, knives that um, 
people make that are just pure artists. I mean, some of the best that are out there. And then also manufactured knives with lifetime warranties, uh, survival kits, etc. Go check it out. And with that being said, David, I think we're ready to start the ride unless you got something else to say. I'm good to go whenever you are, John. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Enoch chapter 54, and we will begin with verse 1. And I looked and turned to another part of the earth and saw there a deep valley burning with fire. And for those of you that watched the previous episode, Enoch 53, the zombie apocalypse, which we uh, is still on uh, the YouTube channel on Now You See TV, we saw there the Valley of Jehoshaphat, and we saw some awesome things there regarding the judgment of the wicked in the last day's confrontation and judgment there in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And now in Enoch 54, we are directed to another part of the earth where there is a deep valley burning with fire. And as we look at this, we get the true picture of the way the Bible describes the underworld and the places of punishment in the afterlife. You know, the, the, in the New Testament, Hades is the New Testament word for the, the underworld place of punishment, and the Old Testament, the word is Sheol. But the Bible also teaches that there will be a resurrection, both of the just and the unjust, and that the final judgment at the great white throne will consist of people being physically cast into the lake of fire, Gehenna, Gehenna. And as we studied in our Enoch 53 zombie apocalypse, that that very word Gehenna, this is where the word Gehenna came from, this place where they would, uh, in the valley of Tafet, they would beat the drums to drown out the screams of the children. And in our society today, people uh, it, it's like the old uh, abortion movie, The Silent Scream. Uh, the children are screaming and terrible things are being done. Human trafficking is just off the charts. But the father hears and the father is soon going to have a day of visitation in the Valley of Decision. And as we begin Enoch 54, we're directed to another place burning with fire. And this is what is taught in Scripture in Matthew chapter 11, 20 and 20 through 24 and other places, that there are degrees of punishment in heaven and degrees of punishment in hell. There's going to be no ice water for nobody in hell, and uh, there is going to be a rest and reward for all in heaven. But there are degrees of reward and punishment. Let's read what Jesus said. Then began he to be at, to a, then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. And when I look at this text, I think about England. England had the Puritans, they had Charles Spurgeon, they had John Wesley. So much light was shed there. I think of America that has had so much uh, gospel truth taught since our nation was founded. Yeah. We think about how will someone from England and America be judged in relationship to someone in Korea or someone in Afghanistan. It truly will be much more merciful at the judgment for people there than for people in America. So true. Ignorance is, is bliss in a lot of ways sometimes, you know, not not knowing, you know, we're judged by the light that we have. You know, you've said that before and, and it talks about that in scripture. And 
America has seen a lot of light. We've had so much blessing on our country in England. And, and all, like you said, all of these countries that had these uh, great people to bring the word into the country, you know, the people that given their life, life so that they could translate the word of God into their own language. And we've been given so much light. And you're right. Uh, there's going to be a lot of blood required at the hand of these countries like ours. And I've never been to Kabul, uh, Afghanistan. I don't really have a desire to go, but I bet if I were there that I could probably search through stores from sun up to sundown and never find a Bible. Mm -hmm. And here in America, uh, people don't even count them worthy. You could go to a junk store and uh, the person there would probably give you one if you had one there, yeah. if you needed one. Such a uh, sin against the light. So much opportunity. Uh, there are so many books that are available. There are so many things that you can get online without even um, purchasing them. There's no excuse for ignorance. And America and England are certainly going to be held accountable for rejecting the great light uh, that we have. Now, in Enoch chapter 21, verse 7, this is an awesome verse. And as you said earlier, this brings up an awesome uh, picture in your mind. Uh, and when I read the book of Enoch, I always ask myself the question, what is he seeing? What is he looking at? What is the Father showing him? And now we begin Enoch 53, the Valley of Jehoshaphat, 54 and 1. There's another place here in Enoch 27 and 1, another place. And from thence I went to another place which was still more horrible than the former. And I saw a horrible thing a great fire there which burnt and blazed and the place was cleft as far as the abyss being full of great descending columns of fire neither its extent or magnitude could i see nor could i conjecture you i just uh, i just think what an awesome thing for Enoch to have actually beheld this. It's just amazing to look at it. Uh, the, the, um, the awesome power of God that no one will be able to escape or to hide from. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I can imagine being, can you imagine being, you know, like, like you said, I try to imagine that in my mind. And um, I mean, it was more horrible than the former. It said, he saw a horrible thing. And the word horrible isn't a isn't a light word. I, I can only imagine seeing that. You know, like you you see a lot of I guess graphic interpretations of of that, or maybe not of exactly this, but of a place like that that was just full of fire and full of uh, destruction. I guess you could say the no, nothingness almost descending, the great descending columns of fire, um, and being outside of the environment that you're used to living in. That would be definitely be frightening. <laughs> And yeah. this is from the guy that rebuked fallen angels to their face. Right. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. And th this is just an awesome thing. The awesome power of God. And in this next slide, we have a snow globe. And I wanted to put this in here for a lot of our new listeners. I know that uh, we get new listener listeners all the time, and we're so thankful for that. And a lot of people haven't done a lot of study or thinking into what we would call biblical cosmology or and I don't mind being labeled a flat earther uh, because basically that's pretty close to what we're saying but this snow globe is a pretty accurate representation of the way the Bible describes the world we live in and basically we have the earth and we're going to read some scriptures about how that uh, the one about the compass being set on the deep and another one about the clay being pressed to the seal where it's just like you would put your hand in some soft clay and it would just kind of have a place in the middle where you would put your fist and it would kind of squish up around the corners. And this is a very accurate actual representation. Now the dome is the firmament and we're going to be looking at uh, scriptures about the firmament. And a lot of times when people think of the firmament, they think of an airy, uh, 
the air we breathe, and there's a difference between the air we breathe and the firmament, two totally different things. And we're going to be going beyond the Thunderdome like Mad Max. We're going to be thinking and we're going to be looking at scriptures in the book of Enoch that will take us beyond the firmament, beyond the snow globe. And we're going to be talking about what is beyond the snow globe and uh, beyond this dome here. So we're really going to be having some awesome things. And we're going to be talking about some things that I don't think anyone has ever even been able or has even attempted to correctly portray these the way that the Bible does. So as we look at these scriptures, Enoch is receiving visions. And to get the most out of this book, we have to try to understand what he's seeing and what, what he's looking at and where he is at. But uh, this is really a, a pretty good idea of what we're talking about here. Now, in the book of Enoch, let's look at chapter 11, verses 11 and 12. And I saw a deep abyss with columns of heavenly fire, and among them I saw columns of fire fall, which were beyond measure, alike towards the height and towards the depth. And beyond the abyss I saw a place which had no firmament of the heaven above. Now, this tells us something. Like if we look at the snow globe, there's the firmament over the earth. Now, Enoch was beyond the globe because when he looked up, there was no firmament. He was beyond uh, the Thunderdome, if you will. There was no firmament of the heaven above and no firmly founded earth beneath it. There was no water upon it and no birds and it was a waste and horrible place. And we're going to be attempting to, and well, we are, because I mean, really, there's scriptures that tell us just exactly what's going on here. And there's a horrible place beyond the firmament. And we're going to be able to understand this and understand the role that it has played all the way back to creation. Now, let's look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 7. And God made the firmament. And we're going to be looking at that word firmament in the Hebrew. And the best Hebrew scholars in all of them, you would not find a Hebrew scholar that would not tell you that the firmament is referring to something solid. And, uh, and God made the firmament, which divided the waters which were under the firmament, from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. Now, in this scripture, there's another concept that we want to have in our mind. We have the earth with the snow globe, and the globe is the firmament. And the Bible says that there were waters underneath the dome, and that there were waters above the dome. Now, the waters above the firmament, this is going to be something that we're going to be studying that's going to unlock the understanding of that which we're talking about, ancient monsters and outer darkness. And we're going to be going all the way to creation until the second coming of Christ where these uh, ancient monsters will be judged. But we're going to see that there's a lot in the Word of God about these ancient monsters, the role they pray, played in primeval history, the role they're playing now, and, uh, and the judgment that does await them. Hmm. Now, in Job chapter 38 verse, excuse me, Job chapter 37 verse 18. Hast thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong as a molten looking glass? Now, this is talking about the firmament. You would not say, boy, did you, see? you know, we, some parts of the world, Los Angeles, there's a big smog problem. You can see the air uh, in uh, Beijing, China also. Big problem with smog. But still, uh, you don't go out and say, wow, uh, the air today was like a molten looking glass. We're yeah. talking about something here that's solid. You know, the sky, the firmament 
It's like a molt, it's strong, and it's like a molten looking glass. It's tangible. If you could go up and tap on it, it would be solid. And the, the KJV translators definitely knew that. I mean, that's why the key word in firmament is firm. That's exactly <laughs> right. Yeah. So, and yeah. Um, and it, the Bible, you see, what we are saying is what the Bible says. Like John said, it's right what you would see in the King James Bible. And also the Hebrew words. The Hebrew words absolutely mean what the King James translators said. The amazing thing is we are at a place in time where science falsely so-called is worshipped instead of the Word of God among almost all professed Bible believers. And people, you know, the Mormons, uh, many people, and not many people, I think, even criticize the Mormons anymore, but the Mormons would say, I believe the Bible as far as it is correctly translated. <laughs> and if, if something in the Bible doesn't agree with Mormon doctrine, well, that wasn't translated correctly. And today, when it comes to plain statements about how our world is, people will agree with the Bible as long as it doesn't disagree with NASA. But when NASA disagrees with the Bible, nine out of 10 or probably even more professed Christians, they're going to go with NASA instead of the word of God. What do you think it is? You think it's a, like a parasite in people's mind to, to, to trust the science. They almost always have to like believe that the science is, is right. Like, I don't know what it is. Like as many times as it's been proven to be completely ridiculous, like spraying DEET all over people, for instance, or you know, all of these random stupid things that they did back in the day that now we look at and we're like, oh, that was, that was stupid. That, that, that literally killed a bunch of people. But at the time, that was the trusted science. What, it, what is it that makes us continue? Not, I know, of course, me and you don't, but like what makes humans continue to trust the science that continues to be detrimental to society over and over and over again? I believe it is the spirit of the age narcissism. Mm. People will hold the Bible in their hand. I go to church on Sunday. I believe the Bible. But yet, here's some man from NASA. He thinks in his human mind, he knows more than that. Yeah. And the egotism and the narcissism of the age, well, that sounds good to me, to my human flesh. I think I know more than God too. And yeah. they will agree with some man in the vanity and the darkness of his mind that would exalt himself over the word of God and the vanity within the creature of modern humanity, it will agree with the man that contradicts the word of God. It's the spirit of the age, the mm -hmm. exaltation of man over God. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, really, unless somebody's actually been themselves have been up, or down whichever way it is you they've been up they've been up high enough to see what's happening they really don't know i mean why do people they'll don't and of course we've had this talk many many times and this is a rabbit trail but with evolution you know this the christian scientists are quick to discount evolution in a heartbeat right any kind of evolution sure. but when it comes to this stuff they there's a block there and i think it's uh the this being scared to be ridiculed because obviously there's ridicule that comes along with being believing that the earth is flat because every, you know, sure. every book since I've been a kid, people were so silly one time. They used to believe that the earth was flat. You know, this yeah. is like ingrained in your head that people were just so stupid. They had no idea that. And, and we're talking about some of the best minds that ever existed on the planet or not the planet, I guess the, the, the flat earth, right. The, some of the best minds, but they were just stupid. You know, that's what we're led to believe and indoctrinated with over and over again despite nobody ever being able to actually see the curve themselves without supposedly going up in a in a a rocket millions of you know, thousands of miles hundreds of miles in the air uh and and you look at you notice like all these rocket pictures they're using a gopro i could literally film you with a gopro right here and you're gonna have a curve a curvature on the side you know it's just curt that's how the way the gopro works it's got that wide angle lens um, but people just believe it, man. It's just, uh, it's a sad world. I guess if we could figure out a way to make people stop believing everything they hear, we'd be able to do something. But it, I think it's just people are, people don't want to hear it. I don't know what, what a Christian would have to lose 
by entertaining the idea that the Bible is true, though. <laughs> well, number one, they wouldn't fit in with the church they go to. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because, I mean, this is the, uh, it's not just the people in the pews, but these are the seminary educated so called pastors that are leading uh, the flocks, I believe, down the path of destruction yep. instead of the path of truth. Yeah, a good example of that is how everybody will say, well, I've seen the curve before in an airplane, but they haven't. They literally haven't. I've been in airplanes. We've been in airplanes over and over and over again. You'll not, you're not going to see a curve. It's oh, not going to happen. The horizon is going to stay at your eye level the entire time. And if you're seeing a curve, then you need to get your eyes checked out because there is no curve at that at that height. It's uh, you don't see it. You know, we've we've had friends that have done laser tests across miles and miles of lakes uh, in order to prove that there is no curvature you know the laser goes straight across if there was curvature over a lake you would notice you know because water always finds its level you would see that by because the laser would be up way above where you could even capture it from that distance so i mean the proof is there i mean the the, the oh, lake yeah. the chicago footage for some people that haven't we do have a documentary on nystv.org by the way that does pretty much line out the flat earth uh, theory in a really really good way and just shows the evidence that it's that it scientific evidence to me that it's that it's probably 100 percent legitimate you know um but you know because there's going to be people tonight well i've seen the curve but you know they haven't everybody yeah. likes to say that but they haven't yeah. you know it's provable science uh you can prove like you say uh if if the curve of the earth is real there's a time when there's something out there that you couldn't see it no more because it would be uh, below your eye level. And the fact that you can see things farther than that, it proves it's a lie. Mm -hmm. And I love these, every time you're watching TV and you see the shot of the ocean, how long and flat it is. Yeah. And I will ask people, you know, well, why does that look so flat? And they'll say, well, water always adjusts and levels itself out. Well, if we've got two thirds of the earth is water, does that mean two thirds of the earth is flat and a third of it's round? This is just nonsensical. Yeah. It makes no sense. Yeah. But what does make sense is the word of God. And we're going to look at something here that's going to lay a foundation for us understanding things. Uh, in Genesis 1, 7, it says, God divided the waters under the firmament from the waters that were above it. And in Psalm 148, it says the waters are still there above the firmament. Let's read the text. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all of his hosts. Praise ye him, sun and moon. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Praise him, ye heaven of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens mm -hmm. there are waters above the heavens and above the firmament so if we keep this picture in our mind we have the snow globe and above the globe there are still waters and we're going to see that an accurate understanding is that there is an ocean above the firmament and this is amazing, but we're going to we're going to see some things that are going to give us um, just an awesome understanding. Now, in Matthew chapter eight and twelve, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And another text in Matthew 22, and there's several texts where Jesus speaks of this place that is outer darkness. And me, you know, the Bible's real. It's talking about some place. Where is this place at? Uh, and he saith unto him, friend, how camest thou in thither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And when I read this, I, I just, uh, I have to throw this in for no extra charge. Uh, Charles Stanley, in his book, 
of eternal security on page 126 and 127. This is what Charles Stanley says. Now back to our original question, where is this place? And that's my question too, where is this place? Represented by the outer darkness in Jesus' parables. To be in the outer darkness is to be in the kingdom of God. Mm. Now, really, to be in the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth is to be in the kingdom of God, but outside the circle of men and women whose faithfulness on this earth has earned them a special rank or position of authority. It is simply a figure of speech describing their low rank or status in God's kingdom. Now, to me, it's hard for me to understand how anyone with the Spirit of God in them can read what Jesus said about this horrible place and say this is a place in the kingdom of God. When people adopt a lie, like Mr. Stanley has bought into a bunch of them, of the once saved, always saved doctrine, they will twist to any extent they have to, to defend their doctrine. The obvious statements here of uh, Jesus describing this horrible place of weeping and gnashing of teeth and an eternity of punishment in outer darkness. And that means, uh, I remember one time uh, when our kids were still at home, we went into a, in a cave and they took us back in this cave in a boat. And the guy said, now we're at a place where there's no light at all. And we're going to turn the lights out and you're going to experience for a few moments total darkness. And it was overwhelming. And I mean, for what this guy says, my goodness, if you're deceived by this kind of stuff, you need to repent and get out of that mess. That's all I can tell you, because this is extremely jacked up in the head. Mm. Yeah, you're getting ready. We're getting ready to see some stuff in Enoch that'll, if you would have read Enoch, you might have rethought that statement, I think, a little bit, huh? But then again, he might not have. I mean, I've been looking at you know the tie between Nicolaitan Nicolaitans and the and the um, the the I guess the practice of bailing, getting paid to corrupt people, and um, in America that's just more prevalent than than almost anywhere in the world, I believe right now oh, especially is. with this whole thing going on with the uh i'm not even going to mention the the word for it because just just so we don't have to worry about this getting banned everybody knows what's going on but all the church a lot of these churches aren't giving medical aren't going to give religious exemptions to people because they're getting paid by uh the medical industry to promote this thing uh if that isn't balaam then i don't know what is um it's interesting that yeah, well, we'll, well, it'll be this another show. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. yeah, it is, and a very important one. Now, in Genesis chapter one and verse two, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, I want to take a close look at this word deep in the Hebrew, the word tom. And uh, I want to look at it uh, in the Dictionary of Old Testament of Theology and Exegesis uh, by Van Gemmeren, the editor. The fourth volume, I will look on page 275. And when it says darkness was upon the face of the deep, we want to think about just exactly what's being said here. And the word tom It can mean several different things. And the word tome, it says, a primeval ocean, depths of the sea, subterranean water, deep. And this word tome can refer just like to the the depths of the ocean, or it could refer to this primeval ocean. We're talking about the ocean that surrounded the earth at the time of creation. And as we saw in Genesis 1-7, there were waters under the firmament and there were waters above the firmament. And this deep is this primeval ocean that was surrounding the earth under the firmament and above that God used to bring creation. Now, there's something else that's a really, really awesome uh, aspect to this. The word deep actually means 
a spiritual entity. Now, this is much like the study on Lucifer. When I began studying out um, the word Shahar in Isaiah 14, Lucifer's father, Shahar, you look at the scriptures about Shahar, he is described as a human being with wings, eyes, uh, the whole thing. And the same is true with the deep. Now, in this uh, theological dictionary, it says this about the word tome. Several scholars contend that tome directly derives from Tiamat, the Akkadian goddess of the primeval ocean in the Enuma Elish. Now, correctly, what, what the deal is, is that Tiamat is a split off and a corruption of the understanding of the deep. In other words, the Bible is the primary and the pagan is the secondary that copied the original. Now, egghead scholars, they got this backwards, but this is something that we've, uh, we've shown that in the Rashomar text that this timeline is definitely off. So when the Bible talks about the deep, this is the same as this goddess Tiamat that we see here. Uh, it goes on to say, um, and let's see, I think that's all I want to read from there for the moment, but let's look at some scriptures. In Job chapter 38 and verse 16, hast thou entered into the springs of the sea or hast thou walked in the search of of the depth. In Psalm 104 and verse 3, who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariots, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. Now, this, um, and we're going to show you some more scriptures in just a minute, how the deep is a creature. Now, this in Psalm 104 verse 3, it talks about the chambers of the Father in the temple in the third heaven. And it says, who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters. Now, in scripture, we see that above the dome, there's like an ocean. Psalm 148, those waters are still there. And the Father set the temple in heaven who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters. The temple in the third heaven is in this, uh, is on top of this ocean. And the book of Revelation, it describes how the waters of God are coming out from the throne. And literally these waters flowed into the earth from the throne and they became the four rivers of the garden of Eden, which made the earth beautiful and lush. But this is a concept. And, uh, brother Adam is going to take a, um, well, I know he will do a, uh, a representation of this. But I mean, this is just absolutely awesome when we began to think how God says it really is. It's almost like um, that it was a terrible movie, but that old um, Kevin Costner movie, Waterworld, and uh, it was just like it, the buildings and everything in the cities were like in the water. Yeah. And this is exactly what's being described here. And it's above the firmament where the ocean is, the heavenly temple sits in the waters. It's an amazing uh, concept. Yeah, when you hear that the earth is his footstool, it makes a little bit more of a more sense, doesn't it? Yes, yes, it really, really does. It really, really does. Now, in Psalm 104 and verse 6, Thou coverest it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. And in uh, Proverbs 8, 27, When he prepared the heavens, I was there. He set a compass upon the face of the depth. And in these waters, and this is another amazing text when you think about it. Uh, in school, we had our compass and uh, we would use it to draw circles. And this is showing that in creation, it's like on this good old flat earth, when the waters were there, 
underneath the firmament, he put a compass on the face of the depth and literally uh, created the dry land. It's a very, very amazing picture of creation, and it's one that does not wind up uh, showing us a glow birth. In Psalm 38, 14, we have a snow glow birth, but not a spinning ball glow birth. In Job 38, 14, it is turned as clay to the seal, and they stand as a garment. And I alluded to this scripture earlier. It's just like you uh, would put a, a seal into a ball of clay, and you turn it, and you would have literally a flat place where you turn it, and it would be kind of turned up on the ends. This is exactly the way. And then in the book of Proverbs, he set a compass on the face of the depth. And these are specific scriptures that show us the true way that God created the, the heavens and the earth. And if we will believe the Bible, we'll get a lot more blessing and understanding than if we don't. Yeah, because these are descriptive. You know, why use people are always like, well, they're just trying to, you know, they're just Job's just talk or they're just talking about in ways that we can understand. But these are descriptive, descriptive sentences here. You know, it's like um, like if I was describing a black eye that I had to the doctor, I'd be like, man, my eye is swollen on the bottom side like. Uh, like a golf ball and on the top it's split open like a banana you know or whatever you know i'm and I, i'm explaining this to them with the intent of them being able to picture it and that's what i see in these scriptures that's what really turned me sure. to the idea is this is god speaking in some of these scriptures were you there when i did this and he talks about all of the things that he did describing it in a way that our minds can can fathom it and, and I remember once I read those, it was just, for me, it was easy. I was like, okay, the Bible says that I believe it. I've already seen science screw up millions of times. These guys don't know what they're talking about half the time. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. I believe this, you know, it's really simple. Yeah. So and, and certainly I approach the word of God in the prophetic passages, the way I do the book of Enoch. Yeah. In that verse in Job 38, well, what's he seen? What's he describing? Yeah. And he's describing creation as the clay turned to the seal. Yeah. And if we will try to meditate upon the word of God and uh, understand, you see, the Bible speaks to us. We always want to literally understand the word of God for just what it says. But the Bible speaks to us in metaphors, symbols, and allegories. And to understand, you see, in a lot of people, they check out here because, quite frankly, they have no capacity to understand the spiritual way that God communicates to his people the deeper truths of God uh, in spiritual words that the Spirit teaches, as Paul said. It's just like in, uh, in the Gospel of John when Jesus said uh, to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Well, there are some people think that Jesus wanted people to come up and bite him, that uh, we're supposed to really drink his real blood, which the Bible says we're not supposed to do, which is exactly what our Catholic friends teach in their doctrine of transubstantiation. We have to be able, and John chapter 2 is another classic example. Uh, Jesus said, um, uh, was talking about, uh, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, he's going to destroy the temple. We're going to arrest him. But it says he was speaking of the temple of his body. You see, he was trying to teach them something spiritual in a metaphor that they can understand, but they didn't get it. John chapter three, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Well, can I enter the second time in my mother's womb? Immediately, he had no capacities for spiritual understanding and he reverted to the natural, you see. Hmm. We have to honor the word of God and we have to start with the basic assumption, which is hard for narcissists, that God knows more than we do. And we have to be able to allow the Holy Spirit to be our teacher, where he can communicate to us in these pictures that are so awesome. And when we get it, wow, yeah, like clay turned to a seal. I got it. I can understand that. And it's a powerful way here that the Lord is teaching us on the mysteries and the wonders of creation. Amen. Now, 
This is the commentary on the book of Genesis by Victor Hamilton. And uh, we're going to have him expound a little bit for us on some ideas we put on the table. I read from the Theological Dictionary of how scholars relate the word tome to the primeval goddess monster Tiamat. Well, this is Mr. Hamilton's conclusions on this. And always, I love it when someone comes up with the same conclusion I do. And this is good. He says here, Further support for Tom as a Hebraized form of Tiamat is found in its association with verbs that can be applied only to human beings or animals. Now, this is what I got with Shahar. You know, this can only be describing a human being or an animal. You know, yeah. uh, it, it's got to be. Shahar has to be a entity the same way with the deep he goes on to say this in several uses of tome apart from genesis 1 2 that occur in a paragraph dealing with yahweh's obliteration of superhuman monsters the best example is in isaiah 51 which we're going to get to in a moment but he gives scriptures here that he uses to validate well yeah when it talks about the deep in many passages, it's got to be talking about a spiritual entity. And this is exactly what we see the pagan writings talk about when they talk about this Tiamat. And the word Tiamat is literally derived from the Hebrew word tome deep. Now let's look at a few of these. Habakkuk 3 and 10. The mountain saw thee, and they trembled, the overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high. Now here's a scripture that shows the deep speaking and lifting his hands up. Uh, in Psalm 42 and 7, deep calleth unto deep, at the noise of thy water spouts, all thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Now here we see an amazing scripture of a deep calling unto another deep. And if this really, if, if what I have concluded and what Mr. Hamilton has said, that literally this deep is an entity, we here see these ancient monsters literally communicating with themselves. They are intelligent entities that can speak, lift up their hands. They have the power of communication. And uh, this is exactly uh, what we see described in scripture. Now, this is a paradigm buster, you know. Uh, this is absolutely uh, busting our paradigm when we think of a place like outer darkness. But just think about it for a moment and go back to our snow globe. And what the Bible says, we have a firmament and underneath the firmament is the sun, moon, and stars. Now, if there is an ocean around the firmament and you go beyond that firmament, what do you got? You got a whole bunch of dark. Mm -hmm. That's what you got. You've got dark and it's outer darkness. And that outer darkness, it just means out. So I believe this is exactly where this outer darkness is. It's out beyond that primeval ocean that surrounds the firmament. And this is the place that Jesus describes, you know, contrary to Charles Stanley, this place out beyond that outer darkness, this is the place of the most horrific torment. It is not a place in the kingdom of God as Mr. Stanley would try to deceive us into believing. Very cool. Now, the Anchor Bible Dictionary. Let's look at, uh, at something here, and let's look at what it says about Tiamat. And again, in the uh, most ancient Sumerian text, uh, Tiamat, in the very word, uh, it is obviously derived from the Hebrew word 
deep. There's a real association there because the a lot of times, sad to say, the devil understands the Bible a lot more than our so-called spiritual leaders, which is terribly obvious. But this is what the Anchor Bible Dictionary says about Tiamat. In the Babylonian liturgical text, Enuma Elish, the goddess Tiamat appears as one of a pair of primordial deities with her consort Apsu. Since the first publication of the text, it has been understood that the goddess represented the seawater from which the name derives Tiamutu. It was posited that Tiamat was the primordial chaos. And this, it appears to be what we could conjecture that Tiamat was. It was an entity that fell that literally had power over the waters. And it is so interesting. And Tiamat and Aspu were the male and the female aspects. And it goes on to say in this article in the Anchor Bible Dictionary, Aspu is slain and Tiamat responds with the creation of monsters. But to no avail, Marduk slays her and creates from her carcass a dome from the sky. Mm. Now, isn't that amazing that the firmament in the Sumerian understanding, now they understood that the firmament was solid, just like the Bible says, the devil knows the Bible's true. But in this spinoff, of Sumerian creation story, Marduk kills Tiamat and from her body, that's what the firmament is made out of. Very interesting how this has been twisted uh, and perverted upside down. But indeed, uh, we can understand that this word deep, tome, is speaking of an ancient monster that was there that was dealt with by the father as he brought creation we have you know it's, it's interesting too because you kind of have a representation of that or a small scale version of that in in the genesis experience with adam and eve you know within a system there was a basically a bubble created within that system that was called the garden of eden yeah and there were at the before it all crept in somehow you know somehow satan i guess you know he entered into the serpent came into this garden area and you, you outside of this garden of eden i would imagine that the fallen entities the angels all of these things were not allowed easy access to this this garden of eden if they were i mean I, you know the in the book of enoch it does talk about the the um Satan's Satan's plural, which is a whole nother book of Enoch show that we'll do. And we've done uh, episodes on before it comes from Enoch chapter 69. Um, but we'll be there before too we'll long. We'll be there again. before you know it. And um, you have this, you know, outside of what the Garden of Eden, it doesn't really tell you all that's outside of the Garden of Eden in Genesis. And it makes you wonder, like, what else? You know, obviously, me and you have the same idea. We know, we believe that there were pre-Adamite type humans outside of yeah. this this Garden of Eden system that God specifically designed for perfection for all of these things. Uh, but it's it's almost like a representation of what we're in right now, like a you know, giving us a clue of what's going on, kind of thing. Yeah, you know. And when we think about this concept of ancient monsters and outer darkness there were and and also i just remembered a babylonian text that talk about the deep another one i have at home but in this ocean there was a time when uh, we see the deep was there and think about satan and when we talk about the world before uh in genesis 1 1 in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was or became without form and void because of the rebellion of Satan. Well, before the fall, uh, what was Satan like? What did he do? And the Bible describes Satan 
as a water monster, just mm-hmm. like Tiamat. Let's think about it. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9, and the great dragon was cast out, the first name he's called by, that old serpent. Mm-hmm. Now, when we think about serpent, we know in the book of Genesis, the serpent was cursed. And uh, but, but the serpent now is like a crawly snake, but before it wasn't. Uh, and what it was, people say, well, we can't know. Well, yeah, you can. But here again, people don't want to believe what the Bible says. And in Isaiah chapter 27 and verse 1, in that day, the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. Now, in this one verse, Leviathan is called a serpent twice. Yeah. If you want to know what Leviathan is, go to Job 41. It's a, basically, it's a sea monster. Yeah. It's a sea monster. And here in the same verse, we see Leviathan called a serpent twice and the dragon in the sea. So we can understand that in this primeval ocean, there was the deep, there was Satan, there was Leviathan, And there's even more ancient monsters described in this outer darkness. Mm. And we're we're going to look at another one here in in just a moment. But in Ezekiel 31, uh, chapter 31, and the fourth verse, there's actually a text here that I believe speaks of uh, the deep as being actually a feminine goddess. Let's look at it. And when we understand the deep as an entity that had power over the waters, if you read the whole chapter of Ezekiel 31, there's a lot of thoughts can come into your mind there, but let's read Ezekiel 31, four. And this is speaking of the Assyrian. The waters made him great. The deep set him up on high and Here we and we understand when we understand the way that God's kingdom and also the kingdom of darkness is. There's the third heaven above the firmament, there's the second heaven where we look up and we see uh, the heavenly luminaries, then there's the first heaven where we live and breathe actual air. And here it says there was an entity called the Assyrian in the first heaven and the deep, the Bible says the deep set him up on high with her rivers running about his plants and sent her little rivers unto all the trees of the field. And I think this could be a direct, well, I believe it absolutely is a reference unto this fallen entity, the deep, which is spoken of, uh, we read in the one text where it, it means seawater. And and in the theological dictionary of the study of the word, it would be the goddess over seawater, over the waters. And here we see in the word of God, this entity called the deep that is empowering this uh, this fallen entity called the Assyrian. And we can understand how uh you know this uh the the dark side works just a little bit better here well it, this brings me back to a episode that we did about ogyges and and tartaria and uh, the ogyges the flood of ogyges well ogyges according in the in greek he was a a titan and ogygion means primeval primal from the earliest ages also gigantic and he, he was known as like the god of the water yeah, uh, the water god, and then you have Typhon, who Zeus would fight off, yeah, to keep from destroying Earth. But he was this this big, giant, gargantuan serpent like creature that he would have to yeah. fight, just like the verse you read about yeah. God fighting the the sword. And and then you have uh, the destroyer; they called it in Typhon. He was like the destroyer of Earth, and we see that symbolism everywhere. I think yeah. we, we called that what Lucifer rising. I think Tartaria, something along those yeah. lines. Which what a great episode, by the way. Yeah, yeah. And we can see all of these mythologies 
They're retelling the stories. Yeah. It's, well, a different name from the goddess, a little different twist. It's all the same story. Yeah. It's the Luciferian interpretation of the scripture through mythology. Hmm. Now, let's see another ancient monster in outer darkness. And I want to go back and I want to reread a statement here in uh, Victor Hamilton's commentary on the book of Genesis. Uh, I'll just read the first part again also. It says, further support for Tom as a Hebraized form of Tiamat is found in its association with verbs that can be applied only to human beings or animals. In several uses, Tom, apart from Genesis 1-2, that occur in a paragraph dealing with Yahweh's obliteration of superhuman monsters. Mm. Yeah, it's right in her Bible, the ancient monsters in outer darkness. It is amazing. He says the best example is Isaiah 51, 9 through 11, where a list of Yahweh's conquest includes Rahab, the dragon of the sea, and the waters of the great deep. Mm. Wow. And and it's it's an awesome thought. Like John said, we believe in a cyclical creation that there was a perfect earth before this one fell into corruption. And the Bible says plainly, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth after this one. And when the Father uh, created the heaven and the earth, he brought together the waters above the firmament and the waters below. And we understand that the Father smashed these dark powers. When he brought forth creation in Genesis 1-1, these ancient monsters in outer darkness were crushed by the Father as he brought forth creation. And it, it's, a, it's a powerful concept. Now, let's read this text in Isaiah 51, beginning in verse 9. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days, in the generations of old, as thou Art thou not it that hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? Art thou not it which hath divided the sea, the waters of the great deep, that hath made the depths of the sea a way for the ransom to pass over? And there's a comparison here with the dividing of the Red Sea with the dividing of the waters of the great deep at creation. It's mm. awesome. Uh, it says here, and it talks about, uh, art thou not it that hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? And Rahab is another one of these ancient monsters that is mentioned in connection with the waters of the deep and with the dragon, mm. which was a, which was a water monster. Now, in Enoch chapter 54, let's read verses 7 through 10. It says here, and they brought the kings and... Two, two through five, dude, I think. Oh, okay. What or, did or I... did I go... Or are we behind here? So Okay. Enoch 54, two through five. There you go. Yep. I think that's Okay. Right. All right. And they brought the kings and the mighty and begin to cast them into this deep valley. And there mine eyes saw how they made these instruments iron chains of immeasurable weight. And I asked the angel of peace who went with me saying, for whom are these chains being prepared? And he said unto me, these are being prepared for the host of Azazel so that they may take them and cast them into the abyss of complete condemnation. Mm. Whoa. And they shall cover their jaws with rough stones as the Lord of spirits commanded. Also in Job 41, it says, speaking of Leviathan, I will put a hook in his jaw. And this is the same language here uh, that is used. And, and what a picture here of the judgment of Azazel. Now, Azazel uh, was mentioned in, uh, 
in the scripture and let's just let's just look at it in Enoch chapter 6 and verse 6 and this refers us back to the angels that are chained we're talking about the 200 that came down in Enoch chapter 6 and verse 6 and there's different places of punishment as we said and we see in the book of Enoch and in scripture there's lots of different places in the underworld where there's going to be degrees of punishment for for humans and angels in Enoch 6 and 6 and they were in all 200 who descended in the days of Jared on the summit of Mount Hermon. And they called it Mount Hermon because they had sworn and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. And upon Mount Hermon, there were the 200 fallen ones. They came down and they began to uh, cohabitate with human women. Now, Azazel, in the sixth chapter of the book of Enoch, is mentioned as one of the leaders. Now, in 8 and 1, we see that tremendous judgment fell upon Azazel because he was the revealer. He is listed as the first of the revealers of fallen angel knowledge unto humanity. And in text, he is even more vilified than uh, Shimzaza, who was listed in Enoch 6 as the leader. But let's read the text here in uh, Enoch chapter 8 and verse 1. And Azazel taught men to make swords. It is upon him, Azazel, that this fallen angel knowledge was taught. And Azazel taught men to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates. Well, I remember your thought on this uh, scripture. We're talking more than just uh, something you would learn in shop class in high school. Uh, we're talking about, you know, in the scripture about the chains of the measurable weight. Mm. Well, if you had a chain, you could weigh it, but yeah. these chains can't be weighed. We're talking about things that go beyond um, the understanding of, as we would understand the physics of the first heaven. Uh, concepts that are uh, zero gravity, uh, weightlessness, things that we are being given explanations on, but they're not uh, the reality and the truth of what's actually real. Yeah, it's it's weird too because when you when you think about it, you know, because there's going to be a big deception coming. I believe that where people are going to see something they almost see as natural anymore uh, coming. And they're it's going to uh, firmly put their trust in science a little bit more because they're going to see. I mean, the fact that these things are using chains, literal chains, like yeah, like you said, immeasurable in in, in uh, weight, but they're using things that we know as normal now, where they used to not be normal. We talked about that one show we did on Enoch where it talked about the metal. Uh, he's like he's going to get rid of it in the earth. He's going to you know come take it back basically you know like like these things may have introduced these these things to our earth uh and made them physical you know you were talking about too azazel in in the scripture you know he was the, he was considered the scapegoat he was the one that all of the sins yeah. got put on it was as Az, azazel he was that was his job he was the the one that got sent out into the wilderness and all the sins were taken yeah. you know um just Mind blowing to think about because it's hard. It's hard as a human that have grown up in this time period to know to know what is supernatural and what's not. Uh, it's hard to know. I mean, we've grown up since uh, you know having vehicles, having airplanes, having all of these things that you know would have been considered magic many years ago. It's just it's it's hard to really wrap your mind around. And I think that's what a hard hard time people have when they read the Book of Enoch and read all these these verses about this well like oh that's that's normal anybody can make a sword but at one time nobody made swords that was not that's the thing right. we weren't out there mining these metals we weren't out there uh women weren't out there beautifying their eyelids because they weren't trying to draw the attention that they were trying to draw uh you know now uh it's, it's just a whole different world we've grown up in it's really hard to fathom yeah i think and nolan can make a sword and a knife yeah, but it's one thing to make a sword and a knife, but how about let's make the first one before yeah. a sword ever existed? Yeah, that's a little more. And we're talking about things here 
uh, and there's all kinds of things we could talk about about all of the supernatural swords yeah. in the uh, bloodline legends of uh, pulling the sword out of the rock and all of that but that's another bunny trail well they even talk about like making like writing books or writing you know that all literally men are still sinning to this day because of the knowledge of being able to write yeah. you know st still deceive because you somebody could write anything like you could write something now and maybe a hundred years from now that might somebody might dig that up and believe everything you wrote and it might be a fiction story altogether you know and you're you're literally passing on, people are literally passing on misinformation left and right, all because of the idea of being able to write down things. You know, I think Enoch is where it says that men weren't, weren't even supposed to do that, you know, and, yeah. and now they are. So, I mean, a lot of the things that were that are natural to us and normal to us now were things that we weren't supposed to even be doing to begin with. That's exactly right. Yeah. So. And Azazel taught men to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates. And made known and made known to them the metals of the earth. This reminds me of a ride we did, where we talked about the white powder, mm. in uh, yeah, with a lot of the research from Lawrence Gardner yep. that he said was made from refined gold, and also uh, it goes on to say, and the art of working them and bracelets and ornaments and the use of antimony. And the beautifying of the eyelids and of all kinds of costly stones and coloring tinctures and it goes on to talk about the cutting of roots and last week on the midnight ride we talked about the zombie powder yeah. how that they actually made uh from roots the poison of the puffer fish and different things and uh there's a dark knowledge that has been passed down to mankind from fallen angels that gives them these deep, deep secrets and the mysteries. Yeah. And many of these are still known to mankind and are possessed within the secret societies that have preserved and propagated this fallen angel, angel knowledge. Now, in Ezekiel chapter 9 and verse 6, seest, it says, Thou seest what Azazel has done, who hath taught all unrighteousness on earth. Now, what a statement. All unrighteousness is traced back to Azazel yeah. revealing this fallen angel knowledge. Yeah. Now, thou seest what Azazel hath done, who hath taught all unrighteousness on earth and revealed the eternal secrets which were preserved in heaven, which men were striving to learn. The secret things, Deuteronomy 29 and 29. And I think uh, I'll just take a moment and turn to that. Uh, Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but to those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. And just like John said, um, so many of the things that our society does, it was never meant to do. We talked about the cities. You know, the Lord said, you know, go fill the earth and multiply. No, let's build a city. Let's yeah. build a tower. Let's get everybody here. Yeah. To, you know, yeah. uh, how, just how uh, messed up things are from God's original intentions. But yeah, Azazel is the revealer of the secrets. And he is singled out even above uh, Shemyaza. Uh, Shemyaza. Yeah. 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 So yeah. that is really something. Now, in Jude 6, we see the connection uh, with the chains. And we saw the chains in the scripture in Enoch that could not even be weighed. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. Now we're going to uh, show you another scripture where that Greek word for habitation is used. And what it means, they left their body. But they left their own habitation. He hath preserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of that great day. This speaks to the judgment of the 200. In 2 Corinthians 5, 2, the word translated habitation in the book of Jude is here translated as our house, which is from heaven. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven speaking of the glorified body 
that believers will one day receive. This is what the fallen angels left. In Luke 20, it says that in the resurrection we'll be equal unto the angels. In our composition, we will have a flesh and bone body just like they have now. So this is amazing. They literally left their bodies. They left their habitation. In Second Peter 2, and verse 4, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but to cast them down to hell, here the word is Tartarus, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. This is the picture uh, that we had described so vividly in the book of Enoch. In Enoch chapter 54 and verse 6, for Michael and Gabriel and Raphael and Phanuel shall take hold of them on that great day and cast them on that day into the burning furnace that the Lord of spirits may take vengeance on them for their unrighteousness in becoming subject to Satan and leading astray those that dwell upon the earth. And in the book of Revelation, there's a phrase that appears over and over many times, and I'll just quickly turn and I'll show you one of them. And here it speaks of the people that were led astray by fallen angel knowledge of those that dwell on the earth. Um, Revelation 13, 8, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Referring to the beast of Revelation 13. We see this phrase in the book of Enoch. We see it echoed in the book of Revelation. In other words, your earth dwellers, the Israel of God is seated in heavenly places with Christ. We're totally different from this. Then there's those that dwell on the earth. Those that dwell on the earth, you're going to worship the beast. Those that dwell and are seated in heavenly places with Christ, the true Israel of God, we're not going to go along with those that dwell on the earth. Another powerful uh, picture, and it goes all the way back to the revealing of the fallen angel knowledge. Now, it's interesting when we think about Second Thessalonians 2 and 11, and for this cause shall God send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And that's because they received not the love of the truth. Where's the truth at? The truth's in this book. If you don't receive the truth in this book, you're going to have a strong delusion that you're going to follow. You're going to be an earth dweller, and not a heaven dweller. And isn't it amazing uh, in 1 Timothy 6.20, Timothy, keep thou which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. There is a direct, unmistakable connection with the strong delusion and the science falsely so called. Mm. It was a problem in Ephesus, when the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, it's a problem now. And uh, this is something that people really, really need to take heart. And you need to really take heed to understand and to choose if you're going to believe the Word of God or if you're going to believe science falsely so-called. Your life and your eternal destiny could depend upon it with the things that uh, are being uh, promoted and soon to be forced upon uh, people. Hmm. In Enoch 54, verses 7 through 10, And in those days shall punishment come from the Lord of spirits, and he will open all the chambers of waters which are above the heavens, and the fountains which are beneath the earth, and the waters shall be joined with the waters which is above the heavens, is the masculine and the water which is beneath the earth is feminine and they shall destroy all who there it is again dwell on the earth and those who dwell under the ends of the heaven and when they shall have recog and when they have recognized their unrighteousness which they have wrought on the earth then by these shall they perish now this is an, another amazing 
uh, passage, I want to read a comment on this. Uh, it mentions the waters above and below as masculine and feminine. I want to read a comment here from this commentary on the book of Enoch uh, in the Hermania series by Nicholsburg and Vanderkam. And uh, they said here, employing a sexual metaphor, amen, to describe the confluence of the waters, the imagery of male and female may have been triggered by the reference to male and female in Genesis 6:19. And what we have here is a metaphor. How did God bring creation? He divided the waters under the heaven from above. These waters coming together were a creation just like it's a metaphor just like a male and a female come together and they cause creation the bringing together and the dividing of these waters was how god created it's a metaphor and here's another instance like i spoke of the book of Enoch and scripture. It will use metaphor to help us see God's creation. It doesn't mean like we've got one drop of water, here's a little girl, and another drop of water is a little boy. We're talking about a metaphor to help us understand the correlation between the waters above and below the firmament and the way that we can understand that a male and a female comes together to, to create another life. You know, something, too, that just like, I think it's in Enoch, and I think it's in chapter 60, if I remember right, where it talks about Leviathan and Behemoth, one being male, one being yes. female, and then being split according. And that, that verse kind of just ties it all in a little bit. I don't know. It's just interesting because I was trying to find it. I think it's Enoch 60. I think this guy wrote yeah. an article, but I'm trying to find it. But um, I think it's Enoch 60. I'm going to look it up real quick. And... But, uh, this is another thing we touched upon this and we're going to be back to Enoch 60 before long. We'll yeah. take another whole look at that. And one of the ideas that we put forth, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and I can't remember. I think it might've been the episode beyond the ice wall. I think so. And we talked about, uh, and there's text it's in second Baruch. It talks about the return of Leviathan and Behemoth. Yeah. And we actually... You want put, me to read this? I yeah, yeah. It's go Enoch, ahead, Enoch through, yeah. chapter 60, verse 7. It says, And on that day were two monsters parted, a female monster named Leviathan to dwell in the abyss of the ocean over the fountains of the waters. And the male is named Behemoth, who occupied with his breast a wasted wilderness named Dudain on the east of the garden where the elect and righteous dwell, where my grandfather was taken up, the seventh from Adam, the first man, whom the Lord of Spirits created. Interesting, yeah. It is. And it, uh, yeah. uh, that is just another whole show. Yeah. And it's another whole show we've touched on before, and we'll be doing it all again yeah. uh, very soon again in the Book of Enoch. Yeah. Um, Interesting, though, he divided the two, two he parted them, you know. Um, and I remember reading that the first time, never really gave it, I guess, a whole lot of thought after the fact, but that's interesting to me yeah. because it does tie in with the, the like what he was saying about Adam and Eve. Yeah. He parted male and yeah. female. Interesting. It starts to make a little more sense. Yeah. The more you dig and the more you look, the yeah. more sense it makes. Yeah. Um, in Genesis chapter 7, 11, and here um, is a very powerful thought we're going to conclude the ride with tonight. In Genesis chapter 7 and verse 11, and in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were open. And here again, we have the same idea, waters from the great deep, here spoken of a great subterranean ocean, and also the windows of heaven, that there's waters above the firmament that both are coming together here in yeah. the flood of Noah. Yeah. It's right there, plain as day. When heaven meets earth, right? Yeah. Yeah. And in Genesis 7 and 24, and the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. For 150 days during God's judgment, they weren't raptured. They weren't taken out by a secret pre trib rapture, but they were preserved by that old prepper Moses. You know, Moses 
he was a prepper. He was a preacher and he was a prepper. Yeah. And for 150 days, while God's judgment of the water was on the earth, they were kept safe in the ark. And in Revelation chapter 9 and verse 5, and to them it was given, speaking about the creatures that are let out of the abyss. Revelation 9 starts with the abyss. Uh, some of these places we've been looking at where these entities are chained, it says, and, uh, and in prison. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. What is five times 30? It's 150 days. There will be a tormenting of people. And it says in their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. Luke 10, Jesus said, we'll tread upon serpents and scorpions. And uh, it's not talking about mashing bugs there. And for the same time period that the people of God were preserved in the ark, the end time Israel of God will be preserved by the seal of God on their foreheads from this same five month judgment that's going to be so unbelievable. We, we did it. We talked about this in another ride and we showed that this is referred to biblically as the time of the indignation when it's so, uh, it'll be so horrific that we will just enter into our chambers as the prophet Isaiah said. We're going to have to do a little duck and cover because this is going to be, uh, it, it's, it's going to be such a, literally hell is going to be released on the earth mm. for five months. And without the seal of God, you're in a lot of trouble. Uh, and it, Noah's flood was a big deal. You know, it was a big deal. This is going to be a big deal. And there's a direct correlation here in the timing of this judgment and the likening of it to it in the flood. I mean, this is something that, uh, we really need to, we really need to take to heart. And I know that, uh, with our midnight ride audience, we're talking to the choir that we are, people are waking up, they're getting ready. They're, uh, they're, they're a prepping and they're a praying and, uh, they're getting ready from what the word of God says is soon going to be coming upon this earth. So true. Thank you so much, David. That was awesome. Um, as always, man, I'm, I'm all, almost get we're giddy when we do the book of Enoch's because it's always something that just, you know, cause, uh, you know, it reminds me when you first start reading the Bible, you get all these things that are just nonstop, like, wow, I never knew this. I never knew that. But the book of Enoch's like opening the Bible again with another fresh look too you know uh, which it is a fresh look every time you read it but this is just gives some added insight to things that i haven't even thought about in a long time you know yeah. haven't thought about it in a long time and so. some of these things before i read the book of enoch i've never thought of at all yeah. You know? yeah until i really look at scripture in the light of this oh yeah look at that that makes sense no, i yeah. love it i love yeah. it so thank you guys so much for listening make sure you guys hit the like button subscribe go um check out fojc radio.com uh, you can get all of david and donna's content on their website is right there they're also on rumble uh and brideon uh same with us you can find us on nystv.org youtube uh not brideon we're not on brideon but rumble uh you can check out all our stuff in case you know anything happens we're trying to scatter our stuff all over anywhere we can so make sure you guys support fojc radio uh support what we're doing and just uh, really feed the things that are helping you guys grow. That's what I. That's what I always suggest, at least to myself. You know, feed the things that are helping me, that are helping me grow, helping my family grow. To feed the things that are spiritually bringing things spiritually to the body, and uh, feed the beast a lot less. You know, uh, the the pastors in this world have been feeding the beast for a long time, and now they're getting ready to step inside the beast's mouth and get eaten. And so we don't want to do that. We want to. We want the seal of God. We want to do the best that we can do to honor the Father, so that we can be found worthy when He returns. And um, that's all I got to say, David. Why don't you end us out? We want to end the ride this evening, as we always do, with great thankfulness to you, the Midnight Ride audience. We thank you so much for your prayers and your support. We couldn't do what we do without you. And a big thank you to everyone that um, is subscribing to the subscription network where the entire Enoch commentary is. It really strengthens our hand to have 
uh, an independent platform where we are not uh, subject to the the censorship the censorship of the powers that be so a big thank you to each and every one of you so with that we just want to close close out the ride for this evening so high five and good night everybody see you next week 10 p.m central next saturday night 10 p.m central on the midnight ride high five and good night everybody and i stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up rise up rise up